Oh. You're listening to the Scotty C and Rye Show. I'm Scotty C. I'm Ryan Masuda. On today's show, we recap the college football playoff, uh, some big coaching moves, and we'll just talk about other stuff that comes up, like maybe basketball or life or cats or TV or movies or the weather or <laughs> how we do today, buddy? <laughs> We're good. We're good over here. Uh, we, Our onions may or may not be growing something else beside onion, but, you know, not, it's not green yet, so I, I think a little growth never hurt anyone on an onion. I mean, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a doctor, so I couldn't tell you. <laughs> or a farmer. No <laughs> doctor or a farmer. <laughs> What's happening on your end? Uh, it seems like there's a there's, there's it seems like there's a lot going on in your head there, Scotty C. <laughs> Man, the weather is miserable today. We're getting some much needed rain. Um, people were so so the prediction was there's going to be three inches of rain, and so they canceled school. <laughs> like a bunch of offices downtown closed. Um, it's really quite pathetic how soft San Francisco is when it comes to rain. Um, so yeah, but it's actually coming down a little bit, it's cold, it's like a real wintry sort of day for the first time since living here. I thought you said it's generally cold there all the time, but I guess winter for Floridians is a little different than winter for people who live in San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, this is like, I guess, a more traditional type of winter day for San Francisco. Maybe not raining as hard, but um, until, you know, like the earth's been warming up. And, you know, like, last winter it was beautiful. And so far up to this point, it's been gorgeous. So who knows? Maybe, uh, like, the real weather will sneak back in. Well, how long is this rain supposed to last since I know you guys needed it, but a lot of rain at once generally doesn't help anything, especially when you have mudslides. Right? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't watch the news or anything like that, so I'm sure <laughs> like a day or two maybe. I don't know. How long does it take to get three inches of rain? No more than a day. I don't know. Didn't Buffalo get like six feet of snow in like 30 hours? <laughs> I don't know. That sounds miserable. <laughs> that sounds so much worse. Couldn't do it. Won't do it. I'll take this rain all day. Plus, I'm, like, super prepped for it coming from Oregon. I got my whole, like, rain get up. It goes over my clothes. I will not be wet. This guy does not get wet. I didn't know you like to get wet, Scott. <laughs> I don't, unless I'm swimming in a very comfortable temperature pool or the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, no, no love for the Pacific there, Scott? Okay. Well, all right. If I'm out in fucking tropical Hawaii, yes, I like the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> A majority of my experiences do not include Hawaii. So the Pacific usually doesn't get a lot of love from me. But it's gotten its way into your heart. I see it. <laughs> uh, yes, when I'm in Hawaii. <laughs> Well, do you want to you want to start off talking about uh, little little sons of anarchy? We might as well, right? Let's get out of the way. Yeah, let me let me get my gloating out of the way, right? Oh, stop it! <laughs> <laughs> What'd you think? Uh, you know what? You know, a lot of people complained about the convenience of the ending of Breaking Bad. And I thought, uh, spoiler alert, everyone, FYI. <laughs> and I thought Jack's just going on like a little mini killing spree, all willy nilly. It's like, oh, easy to kill these people now. Boop, boop, boop. And then, uh, you know, I was fine with that. That that's fine. You know, you have to tie up these loose ends somehow. Why why not just do it that way? But when it got all like metaphysical with like his like. Guardian Angel, and then like the wine and the bread, like with 
Christ and shit, like, that really kind of took me out for a moment. Did it take you out because of the religious overtones? I just, it was just so out of left field. Like, this mysterious homeless woman, just like, it's time. Gives him a blanket, and then there's fucking bread and red wine. Like, I just, like, and then, like, the repeat with the bread at the end. You know, I just didn't, I don't know, just kind of snapped me out of the moment a little bit. I, I mean, come on, if you're a Sons of Anarchy fan, you're able to forgive a lot of reaches, okay? <laughs> like, a lot. <laughs> like, those all, I mean, those guys would all be in maximum security prisons for all of their lives based off <laughs> past seasons. So you can forgive a lot of, like, them getting away with stuff, but, like, the whole, I don't know, it just took me out of the moment. Were you were you just mad because you thought Chibs was going to kill him? When they brought him to the warehouse and he shot him in the arm. <laughs> I wasn't mad, you know. <laughs> I thought that was the most likely scenario. But it turned out, you know, he just couldn't do it, little chibsy poo. So. Uh, one, of, one of the few times I was actually right about something, I couldn't even bet on it. That makes me sad. <laughs> right. And then it being Michael Chiklis also being the truck driver was also another just, like, unnecessary little... You know, the world is fucking flat, sort of deal. You didn't, you didn't think that it was it was interesting of, that Michael Chiklis wouldn't have been taking that route if he hadn't taken Gemma up to the cabin. So there's a bit of a of a twist there. Yeah, I mean, but like he would have eventually seen a truck. Like he wasn't not going to see a truck on a highway at some point. That, that's and, and, the, and, and the company on the side of the truck was Papa's Goods, which was just like, oh, God, just beat me over the head with it a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, he set it up to be, obviously, and, you know, we touched about the religious overtones and obviously the way he started to go with kind of that, he got like that, that, that little smile, kind of started to raise the arms, and it seemed like the whole day was set up to make him sacrifice for his family and to paint just the absolute worst picture for his kids so that there would be no way that his kids would ever want to grow up and emulate him. And so I thought that's what really the whole point of that massive killing spree was, not just to you know tie up loose ends, but to really just set that oh my god image of their father as just this horrible human being who then ended up killing themselves because, I mean, if you're a kid and your dad goes and kills yourself, that's you, you, there's probably a lot of anger that comes from that. So it didn't bother me, I guess, as much just because I kind of saw what the, what the director was trying to do. But some people were complaining about him killing himself, and that didn't really bother me because he wasn't technically a son anymore. Yeah, no, I mean, I didn't have any problem with it. I mean, it was a cool way to go. Like, why not? It was either that or, the, like, Chibs was going to shoot him in the back of the head. And obviously, Chibs didn't want to do that. So it was a very poetic, uh, idealistic way for him to go. Yeah, very romanticized. Yes. yes. Very romanticized. Very enlightened of the director. Well done. But, uh, yeah, man, it was a great show. It really was. I really dug it. Is it in your top five? Top five? Oof. I don't think so, no. Give me five shows that you thought, that you think are better than Sons of Anarchy. Hmm. All right, well, Breaking Bad is the greatest show of all time. Disagree, but continue. No, it's okay. <laughs> you can't be right all the time, right? Um, the Wire. Game of Thrones. The Sopranos. The Shield. Oh, Michael Chiklis. Little love. Yeah. That's where I would go with the, like hour-long serialized dramas. 
I, don't know, I might take out the Sopranos off that list. I don't know. The Sopranos yeah. had a lot of wasted fucking hours. Anyways, I'm not going to deep dive into that right now. That's a very loose, rough five, top five. Minus Breaking Bad is definitely the greatest show of all time. So what is it about... Well, we'll, we'll save the Sopranos discussion for another time because we obviously disagree on that. And if you want to get to the news about Oregon State hiring a new coach... Whoop, whoop. Home run, baby. Nailed it. Out of the park. Could not have made a better hire. Gary Anderson... Former head coach at the University of Wisconsin. Can you believe that? Oregon State hired Wisconsin's head coach. Unbelievable. Such such a great, great, great move. I wonder what that phone call were like. Was like, like, will he consider it? <laughs> He's like, yeah. <laughs> oh, what? Excuse me? <laughs> he will? Here's the contract. It seems like there's a little uh, spousal swapping that's going on between the Big Ten West and the Pac-12 North. <laughs> Dude, such a good move. Could not be more excited. Um, same day they announced the big renovation on Valley Football Center. Make a Grand Slam hire for a coach. We get rid of Mike Riley. It was by far the most productive week in Oregon State football in the past, I don't know how many years. Now, I was trying to troll you yesterday when I asked you if the reason he was leaving was because he was realizing that, you know, Melvin Gordon's going to be gone. Maybe he can't really compete with out Bielema's players as a lot of them leave. But obviously that was just me trying to trying to make you mad because we're such great friends. And he actually was bringing in a better recruiting class this year than he had last year. But, you know, football and the university aside here, you're leaving Madison Corvallis. It's crazy, right? It's fucking crazy. If, if any of you have never been to Madison, it's awesome. And Corvallis, while it has its... its, it's, it's uh, um, fun. You can have fun in Corvallis if you know how to. Yeah, yes. but you have to know how to. Madison, you can trip ass backwards and fall into some water. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's insane, man. I couldn't believe it. At first, I was just like, you know, Wisconsin is such a bigger, more profitable athletic department, um, just better facilities, better stadium, better campus, like, so many better things. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, he wanted the Oregon State job, which is fucking fantastic. I mean, I think it's just going to be such a big improvement over Riley. Like, oh, it's going to be fan oh, it's so good. Such a breath of fresh air as a Beaver fan. Do you think Nebraska regrets not making a call to Anderson? <laughs> Do you think it just wanted <laughs> to move within the Big Ten? They're like, wait, what? <laughs> like, could we have gotten him? Wait, how what did Wisconsin do to us? Yeah. So I yeah, I don't I don't quite understand. I don't know if it's Barry Alvarez. I don't know if it's the assistant pay thing, but like something is driving these guys out of Wisconsin. I understand Bielema leaving because of the assistant pay thing, but like I, I think I was look I looked it up earlier. Like Anderson paid his assistants like two point three seven million last year, whereas Riley paid him two point three five. So there wasn't a big discrepancy there. And I don't think given the season Wisconsin just had that you know, Anderson's assistants were gonna be highly sought after. Well, it's D coordinator, maybe. Pretty good D. Minus, I guess, the last thing. Well. Minus the last thing. Yeah, minus that whole thing. Yeah, I don't know what happened in that game. Well, you, you do, but you still picked Wisconsin anyway. <laughs> I picked Wisconsin? You absolutely did. <laughs> did I talk about Ohio State the entire time, though? Wasn't it that game? Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, that was the one. You 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 fully convinced me that Ohio State was going to win, but I was too lazy to pick another winner. And then you just did the ultimate like WWE move and pulled out the Wisconsin <laughs> minus four pick. <laughs> yeah, that didn't make sense. But, but no, it's I mean it's weird. Like Anderson, obviously, you know Utah State guy. And a lot of the players he recruits comes from California and Utah. So is, 
do you think this is just more of like a geographical thing? Like this guy's more comfortable on the West Coast and it's easier to cut down on geographic limitations when you're recruiting for a Pac-12 school. But, man, at the end of the day, Madison for Corvallis. I know, man. Big, big win for Oregon State. Yeah, I don't know if you just really want to be on the West Coast. Maybe maybe that's as simple as it is. But I think he'll... he'll, he'll uh, his type of offense at Oregon State. Um, I mean, obviously his brand of defense is strong. He was the D coordinator at Utah the year they beat Alabama in the Sugar Bowl. Um, so he definitely knows how to produce high-level defense, which is something uh, Oregon State desperately, desperately, desperately needs right now. And they'll just bring a, a dose of toughness and uh, realness to uh, that program. So hopefully we can bridge this gap with Oregon a little bit. Where does this leave Wisconsin? I don't know, man. I mean, unless Paul Chris takes that job, I don't know who they can really get at this point. Oh, I don't know. Because like, it, it leaves a lot of people just asking, like, why would two coaches leave such a successful program like that um, so quickly behind I, each other? Yeah, I understand Bielema. And, you know, I understand the appeal of recruiting for an SEC school and having Walmart money. I mean, Arkansas, it's not exactly, a, you know, you're not Vanderbilt in the SEC. I mean, Arkansas does traditionally have very good alumni support, and they do, or they are going to be improving their facilities and things like that. Yes, you have to compete with Alabama, LSU, Auburn every year, but at the same time, it makes sense to me to leave Wisconsin for Arkansas. It's certainly much more, I think, extreme to leave Arkansas for Oregon State. You know, obviously, I don't mean this in a, as an affront to Oregon State, but you know, we've talked about some of the limitations that Oregon State has in terms of endowment and facilities and things like that. So it is definitely interesting, and that's you know, two coaches in three years now for Wisconsin. Right. <clears throat> Yeah, and um, yeah, I mean, I, you got. I have. I have to think that Barry Alvarez is playing a big part in that a little bit. Do you think there's a bit of a conflict of interest here now that Barry Alvarez is going to coach Wisconsin in the Outback Bowl against Auburn, and Barry Alvarez is actually still on the college football playoff committee, and he might actually have to evaluate Auburn next year? Uh, no, that's fine. <laughs> Their job is done this year. Like they already they already messed up this year, so I fully expect them to blow it again next year. They put they put the four teams in that you picked. How did they blow it? I know, but like I didn't really want that to be true. It's because I was right. <laughs> so you were going for the reverse jinx? <laughs> <laughs> I mean I, th I thought it was a very likely scenario, the four teams that I picked, but I, you just you, you can't put Ohio State in over Baylor. I just don't see it. So you're trying to put the Clifford stink on them. <laughs> <laughs> I had so many inappropriate jokes just like float to the tip of my tongue just then. <laughs> I'm trying to bait you, and I'm disappointed you're not taking it. <laughs> Woo, that was close. That was definitely going to be a Joyce comment moment. <laughs> uh, well, uh, no, I agree with you. I mean, I don't think there's any reason that Ohio State should have been in over Baylor. But before we get to the playoff, is there any – you said Paul Christ. I just want to throw out a very fun name for the folks in Madison. Rex Ryan. <laughs> oh, my God, that would be amazing. Scheme wise, it would actually be a good fit. I don't know about everything else. Dude, he would just kick it and get so fat on beer and cheese, like it would just not even be a thing. Be king of Wisconsin, just fucking kicking it. Yeah, be a boss. He could parlay that into a Packers D coordinator job when Dom Capers leaves. But <laughs> I don't. I don't really think Rex wants to be a defensive coordinator. So uh, Madison, I just made. Just, just make him a godfather offer. I think he's sick of Gino. But yeah. See, that'd be crazy now because Wisconsin's open and we still got the Michigan job is open. 
So I don't know if those two schools are really competing with each other, but you'd have to think they are a little bit since Michigan is taking their fucking sweet old time doing this. Yeah, the miles to Michigan thing won't die. It just keeps coming up and coming up, and this is amid reports that David Cutcliffe was offered it. It's kind of, depending on which outlet you read, not too credible if that was the truth and that he uh, he turned it down. But no, if that is true... Off, yeah, well, if that is true, that would... I really do think that's Cutcliffe trying to get a raise out of Duke, but at the same time, like, it really looks like, you know, Jim Hackett's looking at his old teammate less pretty hard because the Harbaugh brothers are out of play. I don't know. I mean, is, does David Shaw do anything for you? As a oh, that'd be, that'd be amazing, but he went to Stanford, grew up, you know, around that program. He's, he's not leaving Stanford. There's no way. What do you think's more likely, Les or Shaw? Because I would argue Shaw, but I would argue Les. Because Les has wanted that job in the past. Whether that's waned a little bit in the past few years, you know, I don't know. Um, but but I think it's way more likely that Les Miles takes that job. Over before David Shaw would ever leave Stanford? I don't know. David Shaw, like, Stanford has been successful in football here recently for the past, you know, few years. And you looked at that stadium this year. There were so many empty seats. And it's not even like Stanford was – I mean, Stanford wasn't what they've been the past few years, but they were still a respectable team. And I just don't think Shaw is ever going to get the kind of support at Stanford that he – truly deserves to build a long-term program, and there's no way that Stanford's facilities will ever be able to compete with Michigan's. I mean, Michigan, you have the best of both worlds. Stanford, you really have the best of the academics, and then you kind of have a fickle fan base and facilities that really aren't top-notch in terms of what you need to compete at the highest level. Less, on the other hand... I mean, his his assistants are making over, you know, five and a quarter million dollars every year. I mean, is Michigan going to pony up the money for less, which would be a substantial raise over Brady Hoke, and then pay his assistants as well? I mean, how much like, less has got, you know, he's got the leading SEC defense coming back next year for the most part, and he's going to throw that away to go up and rebuild a Michigan team that, you know, there's really not much hope there. <laughs> it's like I don't. There's not a lot of things that kind of give you hope in that situation. Yeah, I mean, but like I said, David Shaw went to Stanford. Like he he knows the culture surrounding you know ac athletics there. Um, he's very very used to it. Les Miles went to Michigan, <laughs> so I, I think I think there's still a deep and very big fondness in his heart for that school. So whether they actually are able to lure him away is a completely different story because, like you said, he's got a great team coming back, um, recruiting, money. Well, I think Michigan will pay whatever. If it really came down to Michigan does not lack money. So, but I don't know. I don't think either one's very likely to, to be the final pick. I mean, it would be great if Les took it. I'd, I'd be stoked. But I, I don't know if if after all the misses he's had with them, he, if he's really all that into it anymore. Well, what's the what's the whole beef between like the Lloyd Carr group and the Les Miles group? You want to shed a little light on that, dude? I I, I don't know, man. Something must have happened with Lloyd and, and Les at some point in the late '80s, early '90s at the University of Michigan, where they just do not seem to like each other very much. Um, and Lloyd Carr is still a very powerful voice within uh, Michigan athletics. I mean, he basically was the main reason, um, besides his win-loss record, why Rich Rod got forced out after three years. So um, I have to I have to talk to some sources. 
Is that a good thing, though, for Michigan, that Lloyd Carr has such a heavy influence still on the program? It's, I mean, you look at some of these, some of these older coaches. We talked about Barry Alvarez possibly making things difficult for his coaches at Wisconsin. Is that a good thing for Michigan? I mean, Lloyd hasn't exactly been been wrong. It was wrong um, about Brady Hoke. I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's exactly fair. If you look at Brady Hoke's recruiting classes, they were extremely highly ranked and didn't really pan out with any actual talent. Um, so I, w- I would say Lloyd Carr is a positive influence on Michigan football. Well, I mean, it's one, I mean, Al Golden's had pretty highly ranked guys come to Miami. That hasn't done a damn thing either. you got to be able to coach them if you can recruit them, but you can't coach them. What good are you as a coach? Well, I just think, I think recruiting rankings are also misleading. I don't know. Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, didn't, do, didn't do the worst job in the world. He, he also didn't do the, anywhere close to the best. And I don't think you can put that exactly on Lloyd Carr. Because at the time, you know, when, when they hired him, Harbaugh wasn't coming. Miles wasn't coming. Um, Brady Hoke had a lot of support from the 97 National Championship uh, team. A lot of support. A lot of those guys were calling on his behalf. He had just come off another great season at San Diego State. You know, there was a lot of momentum behind him at the time. And, And people, Michigan alumni, were also very excited about him. And it just didn't quite pan out the way everyone was hoping. So we'll just steal your coach now. <laughs> Good luck, man. Good luck. But it's if it sounds like, I mean, if if Lloyd Carr has as much influence as it really seems like he does, and I don't think that's going to happen, whether his former teammate who's running the athletics department right now wants it or not. But no, I think it's really unlikely. But it's way more likely than David Shaw. I don't know. I just. I just see a lot of similarities between Brady Hoke and Al Golden, man. And it seems like Lloyd Carr really is the driver. I mean, obviously, he didn't want to go. He didn't go under his own terms. He made things very difficult on Rich Rodriguez. We saw what Brady Hoke was able to do with Rich Rodriguez's players. And then once he started bringing in his own guys, they were terrible. And yeah, yeah I, I don't. I, winning at San Diego State and the Mountain West and whatever conference they might have been in at the time, that doesn't do much for me. That doesn't really move the needle. You know, it's... I don't know, man. I I think at some point, though, you know, those shadows, you know, that was one of the good things for Jimbo is that when Bobby Bowden got away, he got completely away. Like, he's not sitting there still meddling in things. And I think Charlie Strong has a better chance to succeed, too, just because... Texas is completely cut ties with Mac Brown. I just think when you have one of those big figurehead coaches where their presence takes over a room, you know, you're always going to have the head man overlooking his shoulder. Yeah, I mean, it, it wears down though. I mean, it's not like it's not like Bobby Bowden still has a voice at FSU or you know Tom Osborne has one at Nebraska. You know, they fired Tom Osborne for like one of his best friends in Solich after a nine and three year. But that was the decision made on the university's part. I don't think it was Tom Osborne's decision to not have a role. Like, it would have to come from Michigan. Like, Lloyd Carr is not going to voluntarily step away from his influence in the athletic department. It's not going to happen. Well, I know, but when, when you keep having turnover like this at the athletic, athletic department, at, at the president's level, like, those, those relationships naturally aren't as strong as they used to be. We will, we will see where they go. But, hey, one guy out there who's making almost $600,000 per win is Kirk Ferentz. So you just keep getting them checks, Kirk. Rushing it. Yeah. Almost $600,000 per win this season. So good. Oh, my God. I don't even know what I would do with $600,000. Like, like for reals. For realsies. Well, Ohio State's performance in the 13th game seemed to get them in. Boo. 
<sighs> so what do you? Who's more to blame for Baylor being excluded? The playoff committee, cl not committee. We don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> Although yes, I'm sure, it's the playoff committee. Yeah. I'm sure Baylor might be calling them that, but the playoff committee or the Big Twelve themselves, particularly com their commissioner. The committee, man. So it's totally the committee. Why is it the committee? The committee didn't. The committee did not force the Big 12 to declare co-champions. <laughs> they asked for a co they asked for a champion, and the Big 12 gave them two. And, and that's I don't see what the big deal is like about that. That that really has nothing to do with it. You know, Ohio State won an extra game against Wisconsin, very, 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 very convincingly. But their body work as a whole, I don't think, was as strong as Baylor's. Especially after Baylor went out and beat the ninth-ranked team of the country that same weekend, you know, not as convincingly by any means, but you know, uh, just one loss on the road to West Virginia at a time when West Virginia was on kind of a little bit of a, a hot streak. They were playing much better than they were towards the end of the year. In a big win over TCU, albeit by three points, but whatever. That's still another win against a top ten team. And Ohio State just has one random blowout against Wisconsin. That game doesn't go that way nine out of ten times. <laughs> I feel like you're just you're, you're you're taking what what I said when we were arguing about why you had Ohio State four and I had Baylor four. Like I <laughs> I don't know what to do with you, Scott. <laughs> I'm just saying, man. Urban Meyer is a piece of shit. Ohio State doesn't deserve to be in that game. They're gonna get blown the fuck out. Straight up, yeah, blown out. All right, well then, I'm I'm obviously I obviously think the Big Twelve did a huge disservice to Baylor because at their media days you have the commissioner saying we're always going to apply a tiebreaker to determine to determine who our champion is because we have to put forth the representative to one of the bowl games. So even though the records may be exactly the same, there's either a head-to-head -head competition with the same record or there's a tiebreaker imposed. So we always are going to get to the point of a true champion. And then he goes on this past Sunday to say that he misspoke. Basically what he was doing is he was gambling that he could get two Big 12 teams into the Final Four. And that didn't happen, and now he's got nothing. Yeah. Well, if he thought he was getting both in, he's, he's an idiot. But Nate Silver had an interesting line. He's like, because 538 had TCU's chances of making the playoffs at 98%. And then when they didn't, they're like, well, here's our explanation of why. Like, we thought that the committee's rankings meant something or carried over from one week to another. And then that last week, it just became very clear that I guess that was not the case. But they all, the committee had also alluded that this, I mean, the separation from three through six was not that great. And. It's not like we were talking about the gap between, say, Baylor and, Oklahoma, and, and you know, Oklahoma at 20. I mean, there, there wasn't that big of a gap between 3 through 6, and I think that's why there was so much debate is because those three teams were so similar. But when you have a team and that plays in a conference where every team plays each other so there's no scheduling discrepancies... And one of those teams beats the other team. Like, in no universe that I've ever played sports in is that team that won that game not the champion. Right. No, I'm with you, man. It, it, it was definitely, you know, sort of a BS move. But regardless, the community should have just looked at the totality of, you know, the season. And I don't know how you reward Ohio State over Baylor. Regardless okay. of... Bill Bowlesby being a, a moron, whatever his name is. I think the only reason that they rewarded Ohio State was their non-conference schedule. I mean, yes, they lost to a horrendous Virginia Tech team at home. But they also, yeah, no, they're, they're bad. But they also crushed Cincy, who won a share of the All-American. And they, they beat Navy, who's a bowl team. And, you know, you can shake your head, but that's better than what Baylor had. Yeah, but Baylor, but Baylor's conference schedule is way tougher than their non-conference, than Ohio State's non-conference. 
So I have I have no argument there. I mean, again, I had Baylor in my four. I'm totally with you on that. The one thing that I do think hurt Baylor though was Oklahoma State beating Oklahoma because that reduced a quality win for Baylor and TCU. Yeah. That's true, man. Yeah, it's it was. This is, this is what happens. Now we got human error. You know, first we blame the computers. Now we're blaming the humans. We're never going to be satisfied <laughs> <laughs> until next thing you know, we'll have a 2014 playoff. We we'll all want to fucking kill ourselves. Oh no way! God, that'd be brutal. I can live. I can live with six, and the first two teams get by. But if it goes to eight, like you just look at, like you, if that was the scenario, you'd have Mississippi State in there, without a with its quality wins being LSU, and Auburn, and A and M, and you'd have Michigan State in there with its quality win being Nebraska. And I, that, that's, that's not what I that those two teams don't deserve to have a shot for the national title. Nope. So. Apparently, I've become allergic to my cat in the past five minutes. He is driving my eyes insane. Well, you, you mentioned to me before the show that you hadn't done something for three days. You think that might have be it? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's it. Then I'm on medicine. <laughs> I mean, you're a bartender. You're around it all the time. How do you not have your medicine stuff? <laughs> you know, long weekend, thankfully. All right, so you, it sounds like you have Alabama blowing out Ohio State in New Orleans. Alabama. Do you think we got the final seedings right? I'm going to touch on that super quick. Like, who? Yeah, I, no, I, I'm, for me, I had Oregon 1, I had Alabama 2, I had Florida State and Baylor 3 4. So I would flip Oregon and Alabama. That's just me, but, you know, I can live with it. I'm not, it's, like I can disagree with it and not be extremely mad at it. It's not something that I'm, you know, oh my God, Oregon's getting so such a, a bad job, but you know. See, I would have, I would have had Oregon, FSU, Alabama, Ohio State. Yeah, if I have to choose Ohio State, that would have been my top four. So you're not giving Ohio State much of a shot against Alabama. No. Now, even though I think that is by far the best possible mass- matchup for them, I just I, I think Alabama's just gonna kind of run right 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 over them. It's a good Alabama defense, but it's not an all timer. Uh, I think Auburn proved that they can be exposed deep on those cornerbacks. You know, Landon Collins is a good safety, but their corners aren't exactly what we've come to expect from them. Ohio State does have some speed on the outside. It's just going to be a matter of, you know, Nick Saban having some film now on Cardell Jones and whether he can confuse him, which you give him a month to prepare, it's likely he can, but I don't know. I'm going to kind of say, like, I think this game is going to be similar to Auburn and that it might be close for about two and a half, three quarters, and then... I think there's going to be, whether it's a turnover, a special teams play, and then Alabama, I think, is going to just start piling on. Yeah, I, I, I could see that. I mean, I guess I, I got a little ahead of myself. I mean, like like I said, I think this is definitely Ohio State's best chance for a win, but I still think it's not going to be that great of a game. So I got to confess that even though I've had Oregon number one for a few weeks now, I don't think they have much of a shot against Florida State. And I think we talked about this on here where, you know, we said Florida State and Oregon at a neutral field. I said I'd take Florida State. Florida State gets a month to prepare for them. I got in at FSU as a nine and a half point dog, and I also took Alabama and Florida State as the national title game matchup at plus 375. I... I don't think that the, like Florida State's got they've got dudes, man. They got dudes on the defensive line. They haven't played up to their their talent level, but 
I just don't think Oregon's offensive or defensive lines have any shot against Florida State's athletes. Yeah, it's really going to come down to that offensive line for Oregon, you know, because when Oregon has lost these bowl games before, or just big games in general, it's it's because of the penetration um, up front by the D tackles. By very, uh, if you have very athletic D tackles, you can get upfield. That really puts a kink into their system. That that's been really evident uh, in their losses. And Florida State has those athletes, you know, and they also, you know, as great as Marcus Mariota has played this year, you know, Jameis Winston is just a gamer, man. And uh, it's, I think it's going to be a really, really interesting game, close game, like every Florida State. The thing with Florida State, though, man, if, like, they really need to take this month, like, relax, reset themselves. If they get off to a slow start against Oregon, though, and it's super, like, Oregon will score some touchdowns at some point. You know, Georgia Tech wasn't going to score a touchdown. I mean, they did, but, you know, not the same rate Oregon can. Miami, I could go down the list of the, the, the slow starts for FSU again, blah, blah, blah. Oregon's a different animal offensively, you know. They can jump on you if things go wrong. So, um, They can jump on you if you don't have the athletes to contain them, and I just feel like Florida State's speed, you know, you mentioned the D tackles. And the other thing that concerns me if I'm an Oregon fan is I just don't think my defensive line can get pressure on Winston without blitzing. And as we've seen from Winston the past few years, if you blitz him, he's going to absolutely destroy you. And I don't think Oregon has any shot on getting pressure on him without blitzing. And if they start blitzing him, Rashard Green and Nick O'Leary are just going to pick them apart. And you're right, they should take this month, kind of relax, the pressure's off now, they just, at this point, everyone, we're 0-0 zero and zero here, anyone's getting a loss, they're getting knocked out anyway, but Dalvin Cook has just been, they, they can run the ball now, and I don't know if Oregon can stop him either, you know, Mariota's going to be on that Heisman circuit, he's going to be doing a lot of galas, a lot of dinners, a lot of extracurricular things, you know, Winston's going to be in Tallahassee with his teammates. Yeah, you know, and we've seen in their bowl games that Oregon, you get a month to prepare for that offense. And you yeah, it's a different animal. Yeah, I was thinking about I, I forgot to look it up. I meant to. It's like what Oregon's record is when a team has more than two weeks to prepare or whatever random stat it was. The record comes back down to earth a whole bunch. Yeah. And the whole time this is going to be – touted as a matchup between two Heisman winners, but all of the spotlight's going to be on Mariota and Jameis. I think, Flor I think Florida State eats in this game. It, you're right. If they get off to a slow start, or like Oregon's going to score, but I think Oregon might score early, and then I think Florida State shuts them down. Yeah. I mean, I, gun to my head, I'm definitely picking FSU in this game. You know, um, I think it's gonna be a good game, though. Yeah, it I, it blew my mind that it came out at Oregon minus eight and it jumped to nine and a half. Um, very interesting, but I just think a lot of people that are putting a lot of faith in Mariota maybe haven't watched a lot of Oregon football this year. <laughs> You know, they yeah. see the stats, they see the box score, but Mariota still has problems hitting receivers. And when there's pressure in his face, and he, you know, no disrespect to some of the teams in the Pac-12, but Mariota is just a better athlete, and he can out-athlete them. He's not going to be able to out-athlete the guys on Florida State. No. I mean, Florida State has, has some, some very big boys play defense for them, who are very fast. Very fast. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm stoked, man. I think, I mean, out of the two matchups to start, that's definitely the best one. Um, it'll, it'll be very, very entertaining game. And I really hope FSU wins, because I can't have the Ducks in the national title game. Ooh. No. There's, I mean, 
no matter how badly some segments of the Florida State fan base can rub you, you just got to remember your friends who went through Drew Rutherford, Xavier Lee, Adrian McPherson, Chris Ricks, Wyatt Sexton. I mean, I can go on and on, but you know, you just got to remember though. You're, you just got to remember your friends that actually did suffer, and not this new generation of Florida State fans that knows nothing but Orange Bowls. Right. Yeah, all the Florida State fans who I personally know that went there basically suffered what I went through as a Beaver fan my four years. So, mediocrity to its finest. Well, it sounds like we're both in agreement on what we think is going to happen there in the playoffs. So, I would love to see that Florida State-Bama matchup, not only because I'd make some money on it, but I think that's the matchup that everyone wants to see. That's the matchup that the BCS computers would have given us. And, you know, all along, the one thing people have, the, the people dismissing Florida State have said, you know, what about uh, against Alabama? What again, about against Alabama? I'd love to see Jimbo Fisher go against Alabama. You know what? I'd love to see Jimbo Fisher crush Nick Saban. That'd be so good. I mean, seriously, three teams I, like, truly despise are in this playoff. <laughs> You got Oregon, Ohio State, and Alabama, who I've who I've learned to dislike very very much. So, oh good, Scott. I'm glad. So it's really not like a fun playoff for me <laughs> as a football fan. It's like God, I hate all these teams. I'm I'm right there with you, man. There's this guy at the gym asked me after the SEC championship game. He's like, Oh, were you rooting for Alabama? I was like, I was rooting for them to lose by eighty. <laughs> What do you mean yeah. was I rooting for Alabama? What kind of question is that? Yeah. It's just like, like well, when it, if I was a Kentucky fan, maybe I'd say something stupid like that, but you get out of here with that. You know, it's just like people in Oregon are like, well, they're not playing the Beavers, so you got to root for Oregon. No. No, I don't. There's no, there's no rule <laughs> that says I have to root for Oregon. I will never root for Oregon, ever. I do not want them to succeed in anything. And as much as Jimbo has rubbed me the wrong way at certain points this year, like there's no other team in this Final Four that I'm like, yeah, I like their coach better than Jimbo. Yeah, I like their fans better than, than you know my friends who went to Florida State. Like, no. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Every other school in this has, I mean, all four schools have terrible bandwagon fans, but... Ohio State, Oregon, and Alabama's bandwagon fans have, over the course of my lifetime, been so god-awful that, I'm sorry, I hope horrible things come to you on the football field. Yep, I hope you guys lose hard. So hard! <laughs> yes. well, do, you so, wanna, do you want to talk about some of the, uh, the policy changes here in the NFL before you have to run off to work? I mean, are they even allowed to do that? <laughs> I thought it was, like, all collectively bargained. Well, it looks like Bill Simmons got in more trouble for calling Roger Goodell a liar than Roger Goodell did for actually lying. Yeah. <laughs> it's so bad. It's, like, uh, it's such a joke. I mean, that guy's whole story is crumbled around him, and now they come out with tough personal conduct policy, like, just in time to, like, try and cover it up. I'm just so sick of rich white guys telling me how they didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm over it. I'm so over it this week. This is like the worst week of rich white guys saying they didn't do anything wrong. Rich white guys, you do shit wrong all the time. <laughs> it's legal. It's legal. He lied. It's legal. He didn't say that. It's legal. I mean, he really does believe that he didn't lie when the testimony from Ray Rice's appeal hearing clearly shows that he lied repeatedly. <laughs> blatantly. Just blatantly lied. Okay. Blatantly lied. Now, is there any evidence here that Roger Goodell is actually smart? Because... I never get the feeling from him that he's the smartest guy in the room. Like, is it possible he's just a complete moron? That's very possible. He's a rich white guy. I haven't met a lot of smart rich white guys that I like. 
Well, I mean, you can you can dislike someone and he can still be intelligent. I mean, David Stern was Steve, David Stern seemed intelligent. Like when he spoke, I was just like, you know what? This he's condescending. He's doing something scheming behind my back. Yeah. Smart guy. He's smart. Yeah. He's smart enough to pull it off. Roger Goodell, every time he speaks, I really am shocked he's not asking me if I want fries. <laughs> Oh man, you know it's it's just it's such a joke. The whole thing, it's like a complete joke, and it's just why I'm so checked out of the NFL. Like I just I don't care. I'm glad I've been working on Sundays. Like I just I don't even watch NFL football anymore. I mean, really, the only thing I'm excited for this weekend is the uh, Jets Titans game. Nah, I'm kidding. Johnny Manziel. Johnny Football. He's finally in. If you watch the Jets Titans game, you really hate yourself. Like Yeah, so just just kill yourself. <laughs> like life really hasn't panned out the way you thought it would. Yeah. It's yeah. yeah, NFL is just it's so contradictory. And like I said, I don't know, I'm gonna like I said, I'm in a pissy mood about rich white guys saying they didn't do anything wrong this week. It's a bad week for it. NFL, DIA, United States government, whatever. It's just like a bunch of fucking liars and thieves. I hate all of them. I feel like there's something you really want to get off your chest, Scott, and we don't really talk about some of these issues on this show, but I feel like you really want to. No, I don't. <laughs> I don't. Like I have, The Daily Show has been like just depressing to watch this week. Um, and it's just bad, man. Just bad. I don't want to talk about it. Just know, rich white guys, you're you're also capable of breaking the law and lying. FYI. Ask a Native American. Yeah, but it's okay. Just keep arresting us poor people. It's not a big deal. I feel like if I, I feel like if I keep dancing around this, I'm gonna get a little more and a little more and a little more. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it. I'm off my soapbox. Well, do you have any uh, any prop bet winners? Uh, what do you? Well, first, sorry. What? How do you think you did last week? Before we get to this. Uh, there you go. Like, I got the Wisconsin game wrong. Uh, I. What, what did I got like one and four maybe two and three? Oh, he nailed it! Nailed it, man! One and four. Which one? One and four? Yeah. Uh, brutal, brutal week. Yeah, Arizona, Missouri, Wisconsin, and FSU just bad. Thank you for that backdoor cover, Georgia Tech. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, right. That one. Thankfully, I didn't bet anything. <laughs> bad week. Well, I'll try to I'll try to give you a little bit of prop bets here. Uh, this one's gonna really not help you because you probably won't listen to it before the game happens tonight, but Rams alternative spread, minus 14 and a half. These Thursday night games tend to be blowouts one way or the other, and I just, I don't know, Arizona's pretty banged up on offense, so take Arizona and the, or take the Rams at the alternative line, and I think it was at like plus 400 last I looked. Uh, Brian Hoyer, twelve to one to start the Jets' first game of two thousand and fifteen. Twelve to one. Why not? <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> That's such a bad bet. <laughs> I mean, it's not going to be Geno, is it? No, it is not. Um, Le'Veon Bell, plus four hundred to record two hundred yards from scrimmage for was it the third or fourth consecutive game? They're playing the Falcons. I mean. I, predict, I don't hate that. Yeah, I predict the Falcons will uh, put up some points, so Steelers will probably have to uh, throw, and Le'Veon Bell will be there in the flat. So, unless you got anything to add, Mr. Clifford, any prop bets for the people? No, I, I, I didn't, I didn't bother to look. So, well, you know what? You want a good bet? Take uh, Dos Santos over Stipe Miocic this weekend in the UFC. He's probably at, like, minus 500, but... <laughs> whatever. You know. Yeah, whatever. That's the only thing I got off the top of my head, all right? <laughs> oh, yeah, and I'll just give you... Just take... take. Last I looked, it was Cleveland, 
minus one again, or Cleveland plus one. I think it was Cleveland plus one against uh, Cincinnati. And, you know, Marvin Lewis called Johnny Manziel a midget. And this is the same guy that puts his faith in Andy Dalton. Yeah. Go with Johnny. Yeah. Johnny, bring me back to the NFL. Bring me back. All right. Well, I guess that's it. Yeah, h3cruising.wordpress.com, at the Scotty C, at the Scotty C Show, at rye underscore guy. And, uh, yeah, that's that's about it. Sons of Anarchy is over. College football for a month is going to be pretty ho-hum until we get to the bowl games. But uh, yeah. Scott's got a new coach, and he's happy. Yay!